Welcome to ES310 Lesson 29. Today we'll be beginning the final method of solving for the motion of a rigid body. We will be learning how to find the momentum of a rigid body and then solving for the motion using impulse momentum. More information about this topic can be found in Hibbler's Dynamics textbook, Chapter 19, Sections 1 through 2. We've seen this table before earlier in these lessons. Um, this is the overview of our class. The first part of the class we learned about particles. We studied their kinematics, which mainly involved translation, and we studied their kinetics in th through three different methods, Newton's second law, work and energy, and impulse momentum. Then we moved on to rigid bodies. In the kinematics, we studied both translation and rotation. And in the kinetics, we studied Newton's second law for both translation and rotation work energy for both translation and rotation, and today we start impulse momentum for translation and rotation. Thinking back to working with particles, we had several equations for looking at our impulse and momentum. In the linear regime, we had that the momentum was equal to the mass times the velocity, and the impulse was the integral of the force over some small dt. For a constant force, this reduces to constant force times the difference in the times. The impulse momentum theor theorem then says that the change in momentum is equal to the impulse, or the initial momentum plus the impulse is equal to the final momentum. We also looked at rotation for particles because the particles were moving in an arc, not that they themselves were rotating. But when a particle is moving in an arc, we had rotational momentum, which was equal to R crossed with MV, or you can think of this as the moment of the momentum. And we also had our impulse momentum equations. This is the linear one at the top, and this is the tra rotational one at the bottom. Notice in the rotational one, we're finding the integral of the moment dt instead of the force dt. With rigid bodies, our equations aren't actually going to change from what they were before. In translation, we still have translational momentum equal to m times v, and rotational momentum equal to zero. If we're rotating around a fixed axis, we have a, a translational momentum m times vg, because vg is still translating. Um, the direction of that, of course, is along the circle with the radius of the distance from the fixed point. And we also have a rotational momentum, which is hg. So this is a rotational momentum of the center of gravity, or center of mass, which is ig times omega. We could also find the rotational momentum around the fixed point, which would be io times omega. The omegas are the same. The moments of inertia, the i's, have to correspond to the point that we're looking for. The only two valid points, however, are the center of mass or the fixed center. In general planar motion, we still have our translational momentum equal to mvg, and we have our rotational momentum, which is the same as before, hg equals to ig omega, or if we have a fixed uh, center of instantaneous zero velocity, we can use that as our fixed center, and we have I, ic omega, or any general a can also be used if we use the expression ig omega plus d mvg or the distance times the linear momentum of the center of gravity. So the principle of imp impulse momentum, then, for a rigid body says that the momentum of an object can be changed by applying a force or a moment over some finite time. And this force and moment are, is, of course, your impulse. It's derived from the S Newton's second law, just like impulse momentum was for a rigid body. And we have three equations. The two directions, these are translational and a rotational. And this one is written in terms of ig, but you can also write it in terms of the instantaneous center of zero velocity, or some arbitrary ia like we saw on the previous slide. These can be applied to a collection of rigid bodies as well, but you must use the same point of rotation. So you'll have to find ig for the collection of the bodies. 
our procedure for the impulse momentum method is generally used when you're asked to solve directly for a velocity, a force, or a time. First, you establish an initial reference frame, then you draw your free body diagrams indicating the forces and indicating the velocity directions. Find your moment of inertia around the center of gravity or around the instantaneous center. And then you apply the principle of impulse momentum with just three equations and choose a convenient rotation point. Finally, you will use kinematics if necessary to relate velocities and angular velocities. So as an initial example, I'll take a look at this space capsule. It is moving along the x-axis at a speed of 800 meters per second, it has a mass of 1200 kilograms and a moment of inertia around its center of gravity of 900 kilogram meters squared. At a given point, it turns on a thrust from two little thrusters on the two sides, and that's going to cause it to change, to change direction. And we are asked, if these thrusts are on for 0.3 seconds, what is the angular velocity just after the jets are turned on? So in reality, we're only interested in the angular velocity, so the only equation we really need is the moment equation. But just for practice, let's write out the x and the y equations as well and see what information we get. So in the x direction, our impulse momentum equation says that m v g x 1 plus the impulse, which is the integral of all the forces in the x times dt, is equal to the mass times v g x 2. So our initial velocity in the x direction is 800, so we have 1200, the mass, times 800, which is negative, because this is our typical positive directions. Then our impulse is the sum of the forces in the x direction. Well, the top impulse here, the top force in the x direction gives us negative 400 times the cosine adjacent of 15. Then on the bottom we have positive 400 times the cosine of 15. So in essence in the x direction these cancel each other out and the force is 0 dt. So this is going to equal the mass 1200 times vgx2 since that's 0 then the momentum isn't actually going to be changing because there is no impulse so we have that VGX1 is equal to VGX2, which is equal to 800, negative. In the Y direction, we can write similar equations. We've got MVGY1 plus integral of F in the Y directions. DT is equal to MVGY2. It has no Y direction velocity initially. Just like before, our y forces are going to cancel out, so we get the integral of 400 sine of 15 minus 400 sine of 15 dt. So this is 0. So mvgy2, so vgy2 is also equal to 0. Now the equation, that we, the only equation we actually needed for this is the moment equation. So let's write that out, Ig omega 1 plus the impulse, which is the integral of all the moments times dt, the moments around g, because we're using Ig, is equal to Ig omega 2. There was no omega 1, so this is 0. The moments around mg we've got, so we want to use the perpendicular forces to the distance to g. So we're going to be using the x forces. So we have the top one, x force is, this is the integral of, 400 times the cosine of 15, and the distance upwards to that is 1.5, and that is a positive moment. Then we have the bottom one, which is also a positive moment, which is 400 cosine of 15 times 1.5. That acts over a dt, 
and is equal to IG, which is given as 900 times omega 2. DT, well, this integral is from 0 to 0 0.3, right, because that's our time interval. So this is a constant force. It's just going to be multiplied by d DT. So this is 2 times 400 cosine of 15 times 1.5 times 0 0.3 divided by 900 is equal to omega 2, which is equal to 0 0.386 radians per second. So really, we could have identified from the beginning that we were only interested in the angular velocity and everything else was given, and so all we really needed was this bottom equation. In this example, we have a tennis racket. We're given the weight of the tennis racket and it has a center of gravity at G. And its kg is 0.625, so IG is equal to mass times kg squared, just as a reminder. All right, and then we have, supposedly, there's a, a sweet spot on this tennis racket, point P, where if the ball hits that sweet spot, you will not feel it in your hand. There's no sting felt in your hand. So the idea is if we look at this in the, on the edge, so the ball is going to come in here and hit point P with a force F. This is G, and there is going to be a minimal F roughly equal to zero at the point, we're going to call this point A back at his hand. So this is point A. And we want to figure out what is this distance what is the sweet spot distance, given that this distance is one foot? So in this case, we really only have two equations that we're dealing with, because we only have one direction. Let's call it x direction. And nothing's happening in the y direction. And then we have the moment equation. So let's write, start by writing the x direction. In the x direction, we have mass times velocity of g1 x1 plus the integral of all the forces in the x direction dt is equal to mass times the velocity of the center of gravity in the x direction 2. So this is 0 because it starts at rest. We know the mass, but we don't know the, any of the other things, so let's leave that for now. In the moment equation, we have that ig omega 1 plus the integral of the moments, which is fx times the distance. Um, and in our case, we're using g, so the distance from g to f is rp minus 1. So fx times rp minus 1 dt is our, inter is our moment integral, is equal to ig omega Two. So, it starts at rest, so this term is zero. We can rewrite this integral by pulling out r minus one, which is a constant. So r p minus one integral of f x d t is equal to i g omega two. Now f x d t is the same f x d t that's up in the x equation, so we can plug in mvgx2 for this integral, so we get rp minus 1 times mvgx2 is equal to mkg squared omega 2. We're solving for omega 2, there's an m on both sides, so those cancel. Um, and we can, now we need to relate vgx2 to omega 2. So if we look at this, point A is a fixed point. So A is equal to the instantaneous center of zero velocity. So we can write VG is equal to VA plus omega crossed with RGA. VA is zero. So VG is going to equal omega times one, which is the distance from A to G. So then we can plug that in over here. We have RP minus one times omega times 1 is equal to kg squared omega. These are both omega 2's in this case. Well, there's an omega 2 on both sides of the equation, so we can cancel those. And we can solve then for rp, 
equal to kg squared plus 1, which is equal to 1.39 feet. So one final example, let's take a look at this spool. We have a spool. We are, there's a normal force, there's a weight, and there's a friction. The spool would be, if we're pulling it this way, the spool would be turning this way, which is why the friction is going that way. And so now there are two ways to approach this, and I'm going to show you both of them. We'll do the, fir the difficult one first, and then I'll show you the easier one. The difficult way would be using VG, the, the center of gravity, as our point. The easier way is going to be using an instantaneous center of zero velocity as our, the point we use. All right, so the instantaneous center of zero velocity is going to be this point up here because the rope is fixed to the wall, the wall's not moving, so the rope's not moving, so that point is not moving instantaneously. We'll define the positive directions like this. If that's our instantaneous center of zero velocity, we can relate the velocity of the center to the omega by saying the velocity of the center is equal to the velocity at IC, which is zero, plus omega crossed with the R from, of G from IC. So VG then is going to equal 0.2 times omega, since this distance from the center to up here is 0.2. All right, so that will be useful in a second here. So we need to figure out the value of this friction force. And from, to do that, we know that this is going to equal mu times n, so we need to find n. Well, the only two forces acting in the y direction here are the weight and n. So n is going to equal the weight, which is equal to 100 times 9.81, which is equal to 981. All right. And then the friction is going to equal mu, which is 0.15. 0.15 times normal force, which comes out to be 147.15. P is given as 300, and then we have a T pulling on this rope, which is unknown. And because of that friction, T is not equal to P. If that friction were not there, then T would be equal to P. So we don't know T. So let's write our Y equation, moment, um, impulse momentum equation. So we've got m, mass times the velocity of g, y, and 1, plus the integrals of the sum of the forces dt is equal to mass, velocity of the center of gravity, y, 2. This is 0. Initially, it, was, it started at rest. Over here, it eventually, it hits 20. So vg, y, 2 is going to equal 0.2 times 20 which is equal to 4. So then if we plug in our forces, and they're constant forces, we're going to have the, the fo y forces here. We've got a positive t, a minus p, a positive friction. Those are the forces acting in the y direction. All times some time t is going to equal the mass times 4. And that VG is going to be negative since this 20 is negative. All right, so that's going to be negative. We know P, we know F. We do not know big T or little t. So P and F give us negative 300 plus 147.15 times little t plus big T times little t is equal to negative 400. All right, so then let's look at the moment equation. If we look at the moment equations around G, we're going to have IG times omega 1, which is 0 because it started at rest, plus the integral of all the moments, dt, is equal to ig omega 2. ig, something else we can find in it from initially, this is 0.2 meters up here, so that's the mass times 0.2 squared, which is equal to 4. 
So the moments are, and again, it's, they're all constant forces, so constant moments. We can write the moments as T times 0.2, that gives us a negative moment. P also gives us a negative moment, times 0.1. And the friction gives us a positive moment times 0.3. That's all times some time t is equal to 4 times 20 negative. So we know p, we know f, we can multiply this out. We get negative big T little t times 0.2 minus Let's see, plus negative 300 times 0.1 plus 147.15 times 0.3 times t is equal to negative 80. And we, do, we know that big T times little t is negative 400 minus this, right, moving it to the other side. So we can plug that in over here. We get negative 400 minus negative 300 plus 147.15 times t times 0.2 plus negative 300 times 0.1 plus 147.15 times 0.3 times t is equal to negative 80. The only unknown in this expression is t. There's some math involved, but you can multiply it out. And we can solve for t equal to 9.774. All right, now I promised you an easier way. So let me mark off some space here to show you the easier way. So the easier way is to use I see as your point in, or instead of center of gravity. In that case, the only equation we need is the moment equation, which says that I see, I, I see times omega 1, which is 0 because it's not moving, plus the moments around I see dt is equal to I, I see omega 2. So the moments around I see are just, we don't know t, but t acts at IC, so that's not a big deal. We have p, which is a negative moment, times from here to the center is 0.2, from the center to here is 0.1, so 0.3. And then the friction, which is a positive moment, times 0.5, which is 0.2 to the center, 0.3 down here, so that's 0.5, times this unknown t is equal to I, I, C, times omega 2, which is 20, negative. All right, I, I, C is just I, G, plus the mass times the distance between the two squared. That's parallel axis theorem, times negative 20. So the distance between the center and up here is 0.2. So this is 100 times 0.2 squared. Ig is 4. So we can multiply that all out. P is 300. F is 147.15. So everything is known except the T. And we can solve for T equal to 9.74. So a good deal easier, but you have to have an IC that you can identify and you need to know the distances to it. And remember to use parallel axis there.